Hello, welcome to American Dream Latin Souls. I'm Daniel Ortiz, and today our guest is Erica Hart. Erica, welcome to our program. Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me. Now, you obviously are an entrepreneur, and you're the president or founder of Vino de Corazon. So you are in a business that is near and dear to my heart, which is wine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so we're going to obviously talk about your, you know, your business and how you came to be. So um, first question I want to ask you is, what is your American dream and what does that mean to you? Oh, my American dream. You know, for me, ultimately, it's having the freedom to choose the direction of my life. Period. And of course, as far as um, my choice of opening up uh, a winery in a tasting room, it's really allowed me the freedom to put in, you know, my own flair, mm -hmm. my own style. So are you saying you have flair and style? A little bit. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> a smidgey. <laughs> I, I, mean, this, I, I know you, obviously, we've known each other for some time. And, yes. and that, if someone just asked me to describe Erica, I would flair. <laughs> <laughs> Flair is style is definitely a part of it. Thank you. So uh, what's interesting about your story is that you've taken uh, part of your background, mm -hmm. your heritage and background, we'll mm -hmm. talk about that, and you combined it with something that you love to create something that's totally unique. So tell me about Vino de Corazon. Uh, well, Vino de Corazon wines from the heart. Um, my last name is Hart. Okay. And, um, is that your maiden name or your No, that is my married name. Uh -huh. and, um, what what is your maiden name, just for the record? Morales. Morales, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, it really is really just tapping into all of my ancestry. Okay. Um, but what, what is Vino de Corazon for the audience? The Vino de Corazon is a winery and tasting room, and we have our tasting room in downtown Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. And it's just a small, cozy, wonderful place to come in. And um, we've designed it basically as if you're entering into our home okay. rather than just a, a you know, typical tasting room. So it's a very much a Tuscany meets Santa Fe feeling. And now these are all New Mexico wines, is that right? All New Mexico wines. We'll talk wines. about that mm -hmm. a little bit because people don't realize, or many people don't realize that New Mexico has, I, I believe, the oldest vineyards in North America. Yes. Is that right? It's yes. not in California. Yes. It's New Mexico. It is. And so these are artisan wines. Yes. Uh, from New Mexico vineyards. Yes. And you create this how? Several ways. Um, we do grow you know, we grow in um, Bernalillo, and we have some in Tijeras, but we also, majority of our sourcing comes from Deming. Okay. And um, so, as a blend of all of these three areas, we come up with these fabulous wines that you see in front of you. Mm -hmm. And we're always creating something new. Mm -hmm. You know, we're very, very small, so we produce small amounts, okay. and we sell out quickly. And so, we're always having to bring in new new years and then new different varietals and new blends. Okay. And you work with your husband in this process or your family? How, <laughs> what is the process? Because people think about wines, you know, we have the vision of a big vat and somebody <laughs> dancing, you know, with barefoot and I mean, does that actually happen? Oh, definitely <laughs> did with me. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> you know, um, as a very young girl, uh, my mama was a single mother of 11 kids. 11 kids. 11 Good Hispanic kids. family, right? Yes, Good yes. Catholic family. <laughs> Good Catholic family. <laughs> and we had the great fortune of being born and raised in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we all worked and we did different things, but a big part of it was um, picking, harvesting, you know, fruit, um, strawberries, you know, just different types of um, agriculture out there. And um, So is that when you first got your first inkling about wine and... Growing. Yes. Okay. Yes, You're how yes. old? Oh my gosh, I must have been about uh, seven or eight years old. Okay. And I, I, there was just one, you know, vivid memory of bringing grape home and my little brothers and I stomping it in Is the bathtub, right? and it was just a blast. Oh my, we're just having fun, fun, fun. Did you know you were making wine, or were you just having fun? I think we were just having fun <laughs> ultimately. Uh -huh. But my mama made um, like a sangria, and I have this wonderful vision of still holding my goblet and floating fruit. And I have my own goblet. I take my little brother and we go under the kitchen table and we drink our sangria. Did your so mom nobody know, can bother us. Did your mom know this was... Oh yeah, drink? she's the one that set the tone. Okay. okay. <laughs> she definitely was... Well, sangria is kind of, you know, growing up in a Hispanic family in New Mexico, that's kind of the wine that we grew up with. Mm -hmm. Sangria, you know, and it was just for special occasions for, you know, Thanksgiving or uh, Christmas. 
And, and that's all the wine we knew. I mean, for us, uh, wine was sangria and right. the rest of it, which we knew nothing about. <laughs> so. Well, you know, we actually got to um, dabble a bit more. Um, you know, my mama worked so hard. Of course, we all had to work, but she had to work like 10 times harder than we did. And she would come home very late at night mm -hmm. sometimes. And we would be like little puppies just jumping on her. Mom's home. Mom's home. With 11 kids, you probably wanted attention and oh. <laughs> had a whole lot to go around. Well, you know. you know, that's interesting because growing up Hispanic, uh, you know, we live in, in two worlds. Yes. You know, there's the American culture that we're part of, of course, and then we have the, our native culture, which mm -hmm. is, I describe it in my book, faith, family, and, and frijoles. A and frijoles yeah, is, exactly. You know, the, Lots the, of frijoles. <laughs> well, literally frijoles, but yes. also the, that's a catch-all term I use for culture. Mm -hmm. um, and as an entrepreneur, tell me, tell me how your family influences your business or being an entrepreneur. What role does family play? Uh, everything. Everything. I mean, ultimately, you know, my mama was just, just her tenacity. You know, she was such a, a major um, influence, not just for me, but for all of us. And she just had this incredible passion for life, for all of us, as difficult as it was at many times. Mm -hmm. But she just never gave up, never gave up. It was not in her vocabulary. And that really was passed on to mm -hmm. every single one of us. I see that spirit not only in myself, but all my siblings. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful to be able to live that way and have it passed on to our children, my grandchildren. And, you know, we don't realize how we affect people sure. mm -hmm. until there's a moment in life and they open their mouth and they say something. It's like, I have this moment of my son you know, trying to get through all of the difficulties of this. And there was this difficult moment and my son told me, and I'm in tears. And he said, I am not worried about you, mom. And I looked up with my eyes filled with tears and I said, why? And he goes, because I've never not seen you win. That pierced my life. Is that right? You know, and it was just So like, this is a trait that your mother passed down and you're obviously passing down to your family. And yes. That is a trait that entrepreneurs need, yes. right? Yes. Never giving up. So uh, let's talk up. about entrepreneurship. Obviously, the family is a big part of it. But what, so, what does an entrepreneur mean to you, and how is that different from the rest of society? Well, for me personally, um, I still feel like a you know integral part of society. It was just a matter of me doing what I had to do. It was such a driving force and driving passion that I couldn't even rest. I couldn't even sleep. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had this vision. I mean, a literal vision. I saw it fully with my eyes open. And I had to go for it. And I realized that if I didn't try with my whole heart and soul and spirit, that when I was 90 years old and I was nearing the end of my life, that I would have great regret. And I cannot live without regret. Mm -hmm. I just can't do it. I have to at least try. So we started with a vision, and that's a pattern that I've seen with a lot of entrepreneurs that I worked with, and even my own career, is this, it begins with a vision mm -hmm. and an idea mm -hmm. a lot of times, and sometimes it's palpable and for, for you, and it's mm -hmm. like you cannot not do it. Right. You know, and getting a job, I, I always say that a job is something an entrepreneur gets when they're in between projects. Absolutely, <laughs> right? yes, so yes. So I mean, there's nothing you know, wrong, of course, getting yes. a job, but entrepreneurs have that vision, and then they have that passion, and mm -hmm. I just see your eyes light up, mm -hmm. you know, when you go for that. So, so we start off with the vision, the passion. You have their, your traits that you've inherited from your family. Mm -hmm. And what's the next step? How do you take vision? And Vida de Corazon, I mean, there's nothing like it. It's unique. Mm. Uh, in the Santa Fe City, different, it's unique. Thank you. And so you take that vision, and to make it come to fruition, what are the steps and what were the challenges that you overcame? Well, for me personally, I had the great fortune of managing um, New Mexico's oldest winery at the time, mm -hmm. and it was Anderson Valley Vineyards. But in prior Albuquerque? To, in Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, I had been a wine consultant in California. Okay. That was really when the spark for me happened, that I wanted to be in this industry. So you've been in the wine industry, so to speak? Yes. Since, yeah, since off and young. on throughout my life. Okay. And um, that time in California really sparked it for me. Mm -hmm. But at that time, I didn't know how to navigate myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't have all the tools yet and I knew it. 
So, of course, I left the wine industry for a little bit and went and got a job. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then we left always say that, job. <laughs> I got a job. <laughs> But it was very lucrative for me, and I learned a lot. And you learned I learned. Business, would you say you learned the business part of it? I going? did okay. in many ways. And that's important. I did. You know, because a lot of times we have a vision, we have an idea, and we see the end result, but we don't. We forget about the back end mm -hmm. part of the business. And I think uh, the statistics are something like eight out of ten businesses fail after five years, and I think a that's lot of the I reason hear. for that. That's mm -hmm. a small business stats, but I think a lot of the reason is that people have the idea. They have the vision, the passion, but they lack the business skills, which is so important. And yes. sometimes as an entrepreneur, you know, we're idea people. Right. You know, we're passionate. Yes. You know, things like accounting and taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I can see your face. No. Yeah, <laughs> yes. but that's important. So It's very important to stay alive. Okay, so you learned that. Yes, I, I learned the importance of it, really. Okay. And as I matured, I was able to be able to bring that into my life instead of just running from it and saying, oh, I don't like you, you don't know. Uh -huh and just moving on with my creative, passionate right. side. So I was able to really ground myself and bring that into my life. And um, so, yeah, it's been, it's been quite an experience. Um, of course, my husband, he is just an incredible um, pillar for me in regards to that because his weaknesses are my strengths right. and my strengths are his weaknesses and we come together and then my family is like the most solid foundation for me ever. All my brothers and sisters, my children, my grandchildren, I mean, everybody helps. Mm -hmm. Everybody, you know, so is it's, there. So is it a family business? It is a family okay. business, absolutely, uh -huh. absolutely. All right. So tell me, was there any time in your growing up where the seeds of entrepreneurship were sown? Like in a lot of us, you know, entrepreneurs, we start off when we're young kids. I remember, um, being something around seven years old. And you remember Life Magazine, that the oh, big yeah, glossy, yeah. you know. And Life Magazine, after my parents read it, had they made the best paper airplanes, you know, <laughs> you know that <laughs> gloss. And, and I remember, and I was the only kid on the block, I guess whose family read Life Magazine, so I had a cool paper airplane. Oh, wow. And my friends wanted some, and I figured, well, I'll sell it to you. So I started <laughs> selling paper airplanes, and then the rest of the kids. And then by the end of the week, I got my little sister and her little friends on an assembly line you know, making paper airplanes, and I sent them out door to door, you know, selling them to the to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And you know, who can refuse, you know, a cute little three-year-old selling yes. paper airplanes? So, yeah. So, you know, and I see that's a pattern with a lot of entrepreneurs. So mm -hmm. did you, what was your first oh, experience? so many things. We were so creative. Of course, you know, it was the 60s. You didn't have computers and you didn't have all this stuff so everyone it was always outside yeah. in the garage putting something together our imaginations were just endless uh -huh. and, uh, and then we lived in an agriculture area okay. and so we had tons of food so in our backyard yes okay. and so we i mean we were always squeezing lemons and making lemonade and selling it uh -huh. and uh, we would even um our mama trained us. We would even pick up aluminum cans along the road. We'd be driving. She'd see an aluminum can. We'd pick it up, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, and we'd go and cash that in for money. So it was always thinking, well, how can we, you creating know, something. creating something mm -hmm. because it was really about survival. Mm -hmm. But it was, we had joy in it yeah. as, you know, as we were doing this. So, yeah, there was definitely a lot of, um, a lot of um, little situations there that we were doing that. Uh -huh. So you saw at an early age that you can't take an idea or a can on the side of the road and actually make money. Yes. Okay, and that's yes. typical entrepreneurship. You know, we create our opportunities. Yes. And sometimes we fall, you know, the economy uh, falls yeah. and things happen, but it's always next, next, next. And I, I think entrepreneurs actually are, are born. Uh, I think an environment and mm -hmm. parents and all that help you, but it's a different, type of personality than someone who's looking for a you know, secure job with a retirement at the end of the day. Right. Now, having said that, being an entrepreneur has unique challenges. Yes, it does. Right? And so tell me, what have the, what has been some of the challenges um, that you've overcome or faced and then overcome as, as an entrepreneur? Well, within the tasting room, um, <clears throat> first of all, I was very fortunate to have been in a position at Anderson Valley Vineyards that I, that I was in. And I developed very good relationships within the um, New Mexico winery community. And I didn't really realize that I was building these really um, wonderful relationships as a result of the reputation that I had built from um, Anderson, just building up Anderson. 
And then the winemaker there, Mark, Mark uh, Matheson, he re uh, I started asking him questions because I knew within the first three months that I was going to do my own thing. Mm -hmm. I already knew. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. And so I just needed to um, network, you know, meet the right people and have them kind of guide me and direct me. But of course, it took two years longer than we thought it was going to. So it took that much more money. It and, was and there's just saying in, in entrepreneurship, and I teach my, my coaching clients as an entrepreneur, it takes twice as long, it costs twice as much money. It does. Is that right? It does. Yeah. It absolutely does. And that's where your tenacity and your passion and your like never give up spirit ha takes you through that. And of mm -hmm. course, your faith and your family and everybody along the way. But ultimately, it has to come within you, come from you. Mm -hmm. You know, and so. So, is there any specific challenges that you were. Yeah, we had some incredible challenges. We had. Um, and a the lot liquor industry is pretty heavily regulated. So, there's that bureaucracy, I assume, that you had to deal with. You know, Fortunately, I jumped in. Uh -huh. <laughs> if I didn't jump in, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Right? I wouldn't have this beautiful, you know, tasting room and in this wonderful environment to meet people every day and share our wine and share the love and beauty of wine. I, I just had this vision. I had to do it. I jumped in. I didn't do as much homework as I should have, which mm -hmm. I would definitely recommend. But for me, it worked better that way. Because once I was in, I was in, totally in and I totally had to overcome every single obstacle, and there were many. And because at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of direction for people, um, for the wine industry in regards to like going to a seminar, okay, this is what you need to do. This is the challenges that you're going to meet, and this is what you need to do to overcome it. So here's, a, here's a, the blueprint. So you created this as you went along? Is that yes. What, okay. Yes, and there was so many obstacles, um, legal permitting, state, federal, um, city, county, all so of that. So the bureaucracy. That. All the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. and, and of um, course, entrepreneurs, we, you know how we feel about bureaucracy. Oh, you yeah, know, I'm just like, oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sometimes I felt like an ostrich. I just wanted to put my head in the sand and just stay there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, my heart just kept like, oh, you got to win, you got to win, you got to do this. Mm -hmm. Because I ended up selling my house in California. Wow. A house that I bought from my mama a week before she passed away. Uh -huh. House that I had raised my children in. And it was also my ticket back to California in the event things didn't work uh -huh. out here. But I had made up my mind. I said, this is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. Total commitment. Total commitment. Yeah. Of course, I talked to my, all my brothers and sisters. You know, what do you think about me doing this? And everybody was like, do it. Go for it. Mom would want you to do wow. this because it was your passion. And, and that gives so, you the strength, I think. You know, as Hispanics, you know, one of the, again, we talked about living in two worlds sometimes. And when an Hispanic usually makes a, a decision, like whether it's go to college across the country or to accept a job somewhere or to start a business, it's a family. It's the, the it decision is. is impact on the family as a whole. And as a consequence, sometimes it can be challenges, of course. Mm -hmm. But in your case, everything came together, which I'm hearing is that it gives you the strength to go forward. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Because I think that if I would have had an objection from any of my siblings, I wouldn't have had it in my heart to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. Everybody was supportive. And, and I have a lot of brothers and sisters. And not <laughs> just that, but my own children yeah. and my nieces and nephews. And then my, my um, father, my, my second father, who, um, you know, my mom remarried in 1975. Mm -hmm. And he raised us from that point. And so, you know, he lives with me now. And asking him for permission, which was, was a big thing for me also, mm -hmm. and getting his... Um, so the, the strength of the, of the family helped your business? It does, okay. every single day. Great, great. Every single day. Well, in the short time we have left, I would like okay. you to introduce us to some of your wines. Now, again, these are artisan wines yes, that they are. you are created. You mm -hmm. can't buy these at the store no. or... Order them at a restaurant yet. Not I don't yet. Think. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> We're working on that. But, but this is your own creation. Um, yes. And that's just fascinating to me that somebody can actually create wine. And I've been to your tasting room and, you know, I love the wines. And, um, and so tell us about the wines. Uh, tell us how they were created or inspired. And then I think you're going to give me an opportunity to, to taste two. And we have some pairings. So uh, tell me about the wines. Tell me the short story of the wines. And, and we'll well, first that. of all, I just want to start with our label. Okay. And this label was designed by my husband and myself and family members, everybody's input. So it's Vino del Corazon? It's Vino del Corazon, and it has um, the fleur-de-lis, and part of my background I'm sorry, is it says French. The 
It has the fleur de lis on that, that gold plated. Mean? It's uh, like a, a f um, like a border. Or? Yeah, it's on the border. Mm -hmm. And border lis, okay. this was inspired by my French ancestry. Okay. And then the two hearts. When my husband and I were designing this, we had one heart originally, and my brother says, why don't you put two hearts? Because it took two of you to make this happen. We're like, oh, yeah. So the two hearts represent both my husband and myself, but all of our family and our ancestry. Wow. It really, that's what it really signifies, all of that. Mm -hmm. And then we wanted something a little bit simple but romantic. Okay. And then, of course, the coloring, of course, is the New Mexico's wonderful sunset. Mm -hmm. So that's the label. And we have several wines. We have the Tres Amores, which is Three Loves, and that's inspired by, of course, the three um, different wines in it. But, you know, we have three children, and they are my three loves. So everything has meaning. Everything has okay. meaning, yes. And then um, our Riesling. This is a beautiful Riesling. My brother likes to tell the ladies it's a dietetic Riesling because it's only 1.5% residual sugar okay. rather than your normal three. Then we have a Besso Blush, and this is a sweet, tender kiss from us to everybody. Besso blush, all a right. Besso blush, and then we have a Shiraz, oh, just wonderful, jammy, wonderful with grilled meat, and then we have a, a reserved Cabernet Sauvignon that we've done in an old world French style, mm -hmm. and then we have a Chardonnay. Now Chardonnay is really my baby. And now this I've had before. Yes. <laughs> and I call it the um, uh, what is it? The vanilla wine, which is, but that's what that's the scent that I taste to, yes. when, when I tried it before. So now you have some pairings, is that right? Yes, and I'd like to um, emphasize the Siesta Red. This is our number one seller and our Reserve Merlot for two different reasons. The Siesta Red is a tribute to my mama oh. as a result of um, drinking a lot of wine with her when we were young, but as a result of her, you know, us stomping the grapes in the bathtub and her making the sangria out of it. Uh -huh. And so this is mama's wine, and it's a blend of 60% of a fruity white and 40% of a dry red and we serve it chilled. And I brought some truffles that we actually feature in our tasting room. I have a dark chocolate and I have a pecan that I wanted you to try okay. if you would like. Absolutely. If you don't mind passing me your glass. Okay. And even your glasses have your... Yes, wine. our glasses have our Santa Fe um, New Mexico with Vino del Corazon on it. So do you want to try the Chardonnay at all? Yes. Okay, let's do that first actually okay. if you don't mind. I was kind of hoping you'd say that. Yes. Now this is my baby. This is a, what we call a naked Chardonnay because it is stainless steel. It doesn't have a whole lot of influence of oak. Now we you say know, it's changing stainless the steel. natural it was, flavor. It was, it was created in a stainless steel barrel. Yes. Okay. And what stainless steel does, it allows the natural flavor of the grape to just really pop and just really allow it to just be itself. So it's just so wonderful. It has wonderful soft pear in front mm -hmm. and then it leads into a hint of vanilla and cream on the finish which is wonderful with um, like a green chili cheese fondue with some tortilla strips. Like two of my favorite things, I know. wine and green chili. <laughs> yes, I, exactly. I, I love the, the New Mexico because <laughs> where else are you going to get that? So It's wonderful. Um, well, it's got I a beautiful I'll color, it's very clear. It's very sparkly. clean and clear and just the nose is, oh, just, you can just, it's well, wonderful. Salute. Salute. Oh, that's good. That's refreshing. Oh, I love this. So I drink this a lot. Now, again, you can't get these at the store. You can no. have to get them at your wine tasting. Get them at our tasting room or online. Okay. And you have a wine club. And we do have a wine club. Tell me about the wine club. It's very exciting. It's small because we're small. Uh -huh. And we distribute three times out of a year. And basically, you get two bottles of wine. You get the 15% discount. And you get to enjoy that on any, whether you're inside having a glass of wine. So people or can visit your website. Visit our website, join it, and receive the benefits of it. And our website is um, Vino del Corazon. No, yeah, Vino del Corazon .com. Okay, well, that's yeah. easy enough. Vino yeah, del Corazon simple. .com. And the, your wine tasting room is in downtown Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. We are the only um, wine tasting room in all of downtown Santa Fe. So we have a wonderful little niche. Oh. And we feature only New Mexico product. Santa Fe is somewhere between like the fourth or fifth destination city in mm -hmm. the 
in the country. Mm -hmm. So when people come to Santa Fe and to New Mexico, of course they want New Mexico products. Right. Are they surprised to know that New Mexico has wines and oh, wines I of this caliber? Oh, I love caliber? it. I love telling them because, you know, the little piece of trivia, New Mexico yes. is the oldest wine producing region in the whole U.S. I love sharing that because that is such a wonderful little piece of news to share as a winemaker. Yes. And yeah. people are completely in awe and blown away by the quality of our wines. Absolutely. And that's a story that needs to be told yes. more and more, that New Mexico has some wonderful wines. Yes. So in the two minutes that we have left, do we have another yes. wine here? So I think I have only one glass, so I guess I'm going to have to finish this. Finish that. <laughs> so if you can take... Um, a sip of this and then enjoy the truffle and it's love and love together. I'm a bit of a romantic so I love to really um, emphasize love in any shape, way or form. And this, the, the chocolate with the wine, so the ethyl amines in the chocolate brings out the euphoria within us you know, I just and then with the wine. <laughs> realize what a great job, it's not a job, what a great business you have. I mean wine and chocolate and I know. Uh, so and I get to meet fabulous people from all over the world and really develop some deep bonds and relationships that I really cherish. Now this is a siesta red? That is a siesta red, that is a tribute to our mama and that is the local favorite and our number one seller along with our reserve Merlot. Wow, it makes a difference when you pair it, yes. doesn't it? It changes the flavor, the whole complexion. Pairing is very important, and I love to just share with people what our wines are really enjoyable with and what they go well with as they're tasting. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, Erica, thank you for sharing your story. And thank you. I think you've you. got a great business and um, a unique opportunity, so thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for having and me, And I want to thank our audience for joining us on this edition of American Dream Latin Souls. Thank Salud. you.